Ken Higgins survived a massive stroke 13 years ago. It left him partly paralyzed and affected his speech. Because he needs 24-hour care, a nursing home seemed the only option until his daughter, Susan, gave up work to become his full-time carer. She always seems to know what's wrong with me. She knows what I am. Tell her. Come on, Jack. We're really compatible. I don't think we've ever argued or fallen out. But two years ago, the family had another setback. Susan suffered a double brain hemorrhage. Brain surgery has left her with crippling migraines and a constant fear that another hemorrhage will kill her. But now, Ken and Susan are hoping for an answer to their health problems. This is my body. For thousands of years, people have prayed for miracles. Sometimes people are suddenly and inexplicably cured of serious illness. I absolutely believe in miracles. Absolutely, completely believe in miracles. As a result of surviving her brain hemorrhages, Susan has found faith. She and Ken have joined the Catholic Church. Father David Elder is about to lead a pilgrimage to Lourdes in the south of France, where miracles are said to have happened. The church in Lourdes is simplifying the rules. From this year, it will be much easier to get a miraculous cure officially recognized. But Father David is a miracle skeptic. What is a miracle? I don't know what a miracle is. The church does define a miracle as a cure that's beyond scientific explanation. Science is changing all the time. Jesus cured an awful lot of people. They're all dead now. Have you packed yet? Pardon? Have you packed yet? Packed what? <laughs> Have you packed your suitcase? Oh, no, no. Ken and Susan are joining the pilgrimage to Lourdes tonight. Have you got your things? They're both hoping for a miracle. It might stop me from... You get me a bit better. I hope I can do. I walk out to be able to walk properly, living. I don't see why not. Ken's paralysis means he is totally dependent on Susan. He can't do. He can't do general day-to-day -day things. He can't cook. He can't iron. He can't do anything really. So, what else do I do for you? What do I do for you, really? Nothing, really. I don't know what I'm <laughs> he asked me a silly question. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, what? I'd be lost without you. Anyway. Sorry? I'd be lost without you. Uh, Susan is hoping for a cure as well. She wants to get rid of her migraines. Sometimes it can take me, take me out for a couple of days. The migraines are so bad. So I'm hoping when I go to Lourdes, hoping these might stop. I'm not expecting them to, but it would be nice. <laughs> A group of 40 begin their pilgrimage with a tough overnight coach journey. It's an ungodly hour, it's, it's midnight, isn't it? It's coming up to midnight. The journey out is always the worst part. And you get a chocolate cake in the middle of the night, you know, and bonbons and stuff and things that you just, just can't face. But people just want to be, want to be kind, really, I suppose. Ready, going up. Father David has been taking pilgrims to Lourdes since 1971. Father David doesn't expect a miracle, but does think the trip will help Susan and Ken. There aren't many people with a group this year who are going out for the first time, but Susan and Ken are. Um, and they're, they're also new Catholics, all this stuff is very new to them. And I don't know what the reaction is going to be. But I do know 
that something special will happen. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally, totally convinced about that. Let's go back to I'm looking forward to it. Didn't expect that ever go. So that's come with a very big surprise. But we made up. It's somewhere I've always wanted to go. I suppose no matter what religion, it's, it's open to everybody, isn't it? Susan and Ken head off to Lourdes in search of a miracle. But it's not the only place where they've happened. Phil McCord is one of the few living people who have officially received a miracle. Five years ago, Phil was going blind in his right eye. Doctors thought a corneal transplant was the only way he would regain his sight. But they were wrong. One morning at the convent where Phil works, he heard the chapel's newly renovated organ being played. He went inside to listen. Any time I was quiet, I was thinking about the operation. They take the, the whole front of the eye out and replace the cornea with one harvested from a cadaver. I was uh, not too pleased about that prospect, to say the least. Phil isn't a Catholic, but he prayed to Mother Theodore Guerin, the founder of the convent, for the courage to have the operation. As he prayed, something happened. I remember uh, just <laughs> having a, a sense of relief. Really, at that point, I thought, well, my prayer's been answered. I remember thinking, okay, okay, that was good. I can do this now. Phil didn't realize that as he sat in the chapel, his damaged cornea instantly healed. A cataract still blurred his vision, but when his doctors removed that, his sight returned. No one was more skeptical about this miracle than Phil's three children and his wife, Debbie, a nurse. I had called the doctors that I had worked for before and asked them about it, and they said, no, there's no way that this could work. You know, once it's damaged like that, it won't heal itself. And I thought, okay, fine, you know. Um, so it had to have been a miracle. It, it, you know, it couldn't have been anything else. They had seen resolution of conditions like this, but typically they responded after one or two treatments with the eye drops and, and they responded. The mine was just intractable. It couldn't be, um, couldn't be changed by anything that they did over 10 treatments. The Vatican investigated Phil's cure for five years. 12 doctors agreed it was inexplicable, instantaneous, and permanent. As it met the necessary conditions, it was declared a miracle, a cure by divine intervention. This was the second miracle attributed to Mother Theodore Goering. In 1982, the number of miracles required for sainthood was reduced from four to two. So Mother Theodore now qualifies for the ultimate religious accolade. She will become a saint. Twelve hundred pilgrims are traveling from Indiana to Rome for her canonization ceremony. Phil is among them. Not only has his blindness been cured, now he gets to meet the Pope. All these great things are happening to me, and I didn't do anything for them. I mean, I mean, all this was done to me, for me. I said a simple prayer and asked for some help, and this is what I got. It's been beyond anything we ever expected. Father David's party of 40 pilgrims has arrived in Lourdes for their week-long visit. I've never seen water that colour, it's weird. It's strange, isn't it? Since pilgrimages began here in 1858, Lourdes has grown from a tiny village in the Pyrenees into a vast tourist town with hundreds of hotels and gift shops. Mm -hmm. 
Six million pilgrims come each year. So we've got we're really excited. <laughs> Many of them hoping for a miracle. I suppose you'd like more mobility, wouldn't you? Yeah, more mobility. Yeah. I think you'd like more mobility, be all right. Yeah. And the pain. Yeah. Right, like the left to be all right. Left's good, but the right's basically. It's the idea of not being able to do things, can't. Maybe don't for it. I don't like that. No? Oh. Well, I mean. Got complaints about that then? I've no complaints, but I'm saying I'm not enjoying being in that position. I'd like to be more independent. More independent, like I was. Yeah. Can you see over there? Do you see the Pyramid of Candles? Straight across there. Yeah, the light on. Yeah, that's the grotto. That's yeah. where Mary appeared to Bernadette. Yeah. So, 149 years ago, the story of a peasant girl, who later became a saint, planted Lourdes firmly on the pilgrimage map. The girl claimed to see apparitions of a lady. Bernadette was 14, and she was an asthmatic. She was quite severely disabled really with asthma and she came to cross the river and the river was so cold she lost her breath and had a mild asthmatic attack couldn't come across the river she sat down and she became aware of a kind of presence she had no idea what it was and the next thing it, it, it appeared like a lady Bernadette said she had 18 encounters with the lady who called herself the Immaculate Conception the Catholic Church believed her to be Mary mother of Jesus. On one occasion, the lady is said to have shown Bernadette a spring at the back of the grotto. She was told to wash. Word spread, and hundreds of people came to bathe in the spring water. After the fifth apparition, a mother with her disabled youngster came down and she washed the child in the spring. The child recovered immediately. And of course, that kind of word gets round like wildfire. Now, ever since, people have seen these waters as special, as having miraculous powers. Do you know, it's simply spring water, but it's from this sacred place. I mean, um, it's wonderful with whiskey, by the way. <laughs> the spring water didn't help Bernadette. She suffered from asthma until her death at the age of 35. But within nine months of her apparitions, seven people were miraculously cured from blindness or disease while using the water. Pillbox. Why would they make pillboxes in Lourdes? Huh? Pillbox in Lourdes. <laughs> in recent years, there have been very few miracles at Lourdes. The last one was 1987. Jean-Pierre Belly, bedridden with multiple sclerosis, suddenly got up and walked. His illness never returned. Dr. Tellier is head of the medical bureau at Lourdes. He vets people who claim to have been cured. Before a miracle can be officially recognized, Dr. Tellier must be convinced there has been a cure. My first job is to listen to the person and to judge pretty quickly whether this cure has any scientific or medical value in the first instance. Then if it has any spiritual value, as we aren't dealing with a straightforward, banal cure, but a cure granted by Our Lady of Lourdes. Dr. Tellier thinks people sometimes imagine or pretend they have been cured. I believe one can tell straight away if there is a feeling of truthfulness about the person's statements, as the person tends to be concise and they often speak with a lot of emotion, because what they've experienced was a unique moment in their life. On the other hand, people who come and tell me how miraculous it all is, almost immediately it feels like they've embellished and embellished and embellished. Whether Dr. Tellier believes a cure has taken place or not, a miracle cannot be recognized 
if the person has had medical treatment for their illness. One of the criteria which the church required was that there shouldn't be any treatment going on at the time of the cure. Nowadays, that's impossible. Anyone suffering from a serious illness has treatment. Because of this rule about medical treatment, only 67 miracles have been recognized at Lourdes. Yet 7,000 people have officially experienced some sort of cure. People may have had medical treatment for 10 years without any results, the best treatments. Yet, when they come to Lourdes, they are healed immediately. For me, it's obviously a miraculous cure. But even if Dr. Tellier thinks it is a miraculous cure, church rules say it is not a miracle if medical treatment has been given. So officials at Lourdes have created a sub-miracle category for these cures, an authentic cure by grace. The 21 doctors on the International Medical Committee are the final hurdle before an authentic cure by grace can be recognized. They are meeting to consider the first cases in this sub-miracle category. Before, unless we fulfilled the official church criteria, we didn't say a thing. This meant that we have hundreds and even thousands of real cures that were simply buried. They have remained in the archives of the medical bureau as food for mice. The group from Lancashire are staying at Hosanna House, a Christian retreat in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Can we join you? Susan and Ken are not particularly bothered which category of cure they get. They just hope and pray they'll get one. That's yours. That's a bit too full, isn't it? But Father David thinks their trip to Lourdes is important for different reasons. We went for a drive. People, I guess, will always come to Lourdes hoping for a miracle. We never, ever give people the sense that it's about miracles. It's not. I think what it is about, it's a sense of making contact with real people, seeing people who are far worse than you are, far more um, disabled or sick, finding people who treat you as a, not as a cripple, but just as an ordinary person. Timmy, there's something here that, that Susan's brought you today. Something for you. What do you think that is? <laughs> what would you say that is? A bell. A bell. That's from Susan. Uh, that's from Susan. And the team. <laughs> so when people come to Leward expecting a miracle, it really is up to people like myself to say something different, to try to help them to understand that's not what it's about, that's not what we're trying to do, that's not what God wants. <laughs> <laughs> Grotto is the place where Bernadette claimed to see visions of the lady. It is the focal point for pilgrims who come to Lourdes. The river, which once flowed up to the grotto, has been rerouted to accommodate the crowds. If we all go quiet to the grotto, we want no snoring. <laughs> Did you hear me? Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> Father David is taking the pilgrims for their first visit. Like millions of others, Susan and Ken hope visiting the grotto will provide the cures they are both looking for. Father David doesn't share their view. 
I think I'd collapse on the spot if you hadn't jumped out of his chair. You know, mm -hmm. you don't expect. It's not what you come for. What do you think? Truthfully, I'm hoping I never get another hemorrhage and all my migraines and headaches go. And I won't know, I won't know that today, will I? No. When people go to a place that has been touched by the sacred, there is a very special transmission happens. It's sharing in that experience, it's being part of the sacred. Can I ask you to push him? I want to touch the wall. Okay. Right. Go to what? Touch the wall. When we go to the grotto, it's almost a meditation. It's peaceful thoughts, it's just praying to the people who've passed over, praying to Mary. Basically, it's asking for help, isn't it? It's asking for help. Since Bernadette's visions 149 years ago, 18 churches have been built in the sacred area around the grotto. The spring water has been channeled into a massive underground reservoir. It is pumped to taps for the pilgrims to wash in, drink and collect. Souvenir shops sell water carriers so that people can take the water away. More than 14 million litres are used each year. As no apparent cure happened in the grotto, Susan and Ken try a wash in the spring water. It never occurred to me that you would put the water on your head. Really? But that was what, that was what you needed to do. Yes, yes. I could quite easily have put my head under it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it felt tingly, felt cold. Oh, tingly. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, it was a good wash anyway. You had a good wash, yeah. yeah. Still yeah. wet. It's still wet, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, wet. Mm. How did you feel, Ken? That's the I know. Hmm? The cleaner somehow. Cleaner somehow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, still wet now. people would come and see that and they would say, well, that's a bit daft, really. What's, what's, it's only yeah, to yeah. tap in a ball, you know? Um, but it's, it's more than that. I think the more is kind of inside us, you know? But look at all these people. I mean, this, this, nobody's doing anybody any harm. The only thing in here is goodness and kindness. That's all you can see is just people helping each other. <laughs> Apart from you when you've got that dirty laugh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no one is notorious for people pushing and shoving and I mean, you're looking, at, you're looking at things, you know. So that's why I'm giggling, really, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting old and kind of decrepit and, you know, looking at the old days. Right, no, get, get back under that water. Get back under that water. Get back under that water. Go and get the water in the bed. Player. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, Mother Theodore Guerin will become a saint, the ultimate honor bestowed by the Catholic Church. Phil McCord's cure of blindness was attributed to her. He and Debbie are in Rome for the canonization ceremony. Okay, well, after the ceremony, come on. The three of us get to be part of a procession, an offertory, where we'll go right up to the Pope. And that's definitely not something I ever expected to have happen to me.
Hidden away inside the Vatican is the Congregation for Causes of Saints, the saint factory of the Catholic Church. The first saint was canonized in 993 AD. Since then, every aspect of a potential saint's life has been meticulously researched and kept in the archives. Mother Theodore Guerin's documents are stored with the records of Joan of Arc, Saint Bernadette and Mother Teresa. To qualify for sainthood, a person must be considered holy, worthy of emanating and believed to be in heaven. Ultimately, the decision on sainthood rests with the Pope. It's a collegial effort on the part of many different people to bring together to the Holy Father an evaluation of the cause so that he can make a highly informed judgment as to whether to proceed. Monsignor Sarno works alongside the devil's advocate, an actual role, not just a Hollywood creation. We keep to his original title, which is the promoter of the faith, the one who promotes the faith. In other words, the truth, arriving at the truth, that's the key. So the promoter of the faith then has the responsibility to make sure that all possible elements of a cause have been discussed. So that can be both positive elements and negative elements. So in that sense, there's still a sense of that devil's advocate, someone who makes sure that there is nothing against the cause. So we can't get this idea that, you know, it's like five minutes before the Holy Father is to make a judgment, we find out something about it. It's a constant sifting till it finally reaches the point where the Holy Father says, yes, it can proceed. Since the time of Jesus, the Catholic Church has recognized around 10,000 saints. Two and a half thousand more are currently being considered. Six a.m. on the morning of Mother Theodore Guerin's canonization. Pope Benedict will make four saints today. 20,000 pilgrims from all over the world wait to get into St. Peter's Square for the ceremony. It feels a little unreal. <laughs> Still, I suppose when we're up there, it'll be, somehow it'll fall into place. The atmosphere amongst the international crowd is not as Christian as might be expected. Watched over by the carved statues of earlier saints, Pope Benedict presides over the ceremony. His predecessor, Pope John Paul II, canonized more saints than all the popes in the previous 500 years. He changed the rules, halving the number of miracles required for sainthood. As Phil's blindness was officially cured by Mother Theodore's second miracle, he takes part in the ceremony. I didn't expect a miracle at all. So to receive a cure, it took me a long time to understand that it came about as a result of divine intervention, if you will. The enormity of what happened, the rarity of what happened, is still uh, just mind-boggling to me. Savoring the moment. Savoring the moment. 
I'm thinking the history that she's been made. Oh, okay. Thinking of lunch. Lunch is good now. Father David's group are nearing the end of their week. The sick have been blessed, and everyone has attended spectacular masses. The pilgrims have carried lanterns in torch-like processions with thousands of others. But so far, there have been no signs of miracles, or even authentic cures by grace. Ken hasn't given up hope of a cure. On their final morning, he tries the spring water one last time. I know my dad hoped he'd walk, but he also has to accept he's coming to the end of his life. Death happens to us all, you know, and he's, he's lived a good long life. He's been a really good, honest, decent man all of his life. Really decent, honest man. While Ken hasn't yet had a miracle, he has had a great holiday. Having a good one here, I've really enjoyed. You feel something inside, you feel better. And there's a chance that it might just uh, get better. We all know for another, another week or two. If it works on me, it'll be, be a week or two take to take effect. And I think it's taking effect now, you know, I feel a lot better. Father David didn't expect any miracles, but he did expect something special to happen. He feels it has. It's been amazing. There's a great sense of, of joy amongst the people, you know. Not, we're all going back with flu and stuff, you know. We haven't had the cure. <laughs> well, we have, really. We have. But because the cure, like I said, our hearts into it, Susan. That's what the cure is. I had a pocket full of lemons a few minutes ago. Have, have you got any for it? I might have some of my bag. Yeah. I'll pass the lemon sips around later. <laughs> Susan has caught a cold, but she hasn't had a migraine since coming to Lourdes. She hopes they don't return when she gets home. Usually I'm taking migraine tablets almost every day, and I'm not taking anything since I've been here. I hope for no more brain hemorrhages. I hope no more migraines, and I hope I stay healthy. In Terre Haute, the new saint is creating quite a stir. Despite dying 150 years ago, Mother Theodore Guerin's canonization has given her celebrity status in America. Phil is back in the chapel where his miracle took place for an unusual service. We had hoped, as a result of the canonization, word about Mother Theodore would get out to a broader population. And that has happened. Four kilometers of the state highway will be dedicated to America's eighth saint. Some believe St. Theodore may grant more miracles. Pilgrims are beginning to visit the convent in the hope that she does. The tourism people grab this right from the very beginning, and they think that there will be the continuing pull from people with tour buses and people in tour buses eat and buy gifts and stay overnight, and uh, they think it will just be another continuing attraction for the area. The convent's gift shop 
has seen a 600% increase in profits since the canonization. Statues of St. Theodore Guerin are selling particularly well. Probably some people will feel the urge to uh, contribute to some of the missions of the sisters. So if that happens, then, well, that's all to the good. Two months after returning from Lourdes, and Susan still hasn't had a migraine. She thinks this is because the holiday made her more relaxed, not because she had a miracle or a cure. I always saw Lourdes as just miracle cures, and either you had one or you didn't, and there was, for every miracle that occurred, there was thousands and thousands of people that didn't have a cure talking to other people while I was there and, and listening to other people. They tell me there's two cures, the healing cure and the miracle cure. And I think I've certainly had some of the healing cures. Jack, stop it. Up, up, Jack, get to, get to. Ken still can't walk. The cure he thought might have begun in Lourdes has not happened. Jack. Stay here. He thinks he should have spent longer in the grotto. I didn't really have enough time. It was too quick. I had no chance to do anything with one walk through. You mean me pushing you in the wheelchair just took you through too quick? Yeah, you went through too quick. Mm. Well, in any case, it, you go, go through too quick, really. Yeah. If you're after something like that, you need to just walk through. You stay for a while. To catch anything, to see her with the lady. She's you can't see her, but she's there in the background. And to see you gotta spend some time praying. And then you may catch it with her. Ken has already put his name down for the next pilgrimage to Lewards. Gotta have another go. Then I may just touch lucky. So are you going again next year? Oh yes, I'm going again next year. Put your oh, name down. I'm going to spend more time going through. Can I come? Well, think, think ask me later. Ask me later. Please. You might do. I'll you, go on. You have to make sure that's what it is. Can I come next year? Jack, she <laughs> let, let her come what? <laughs> She's sending me look. All right. <laughs> Who's going to do your washing now, you know? For more information on tonight's programme, or to view it again, you can visit our website on bbc.co.uk forward slash this world. If you'd like to be reminded about upcoming This World programmes, text this world to 81010 to receive our free text alert service. <laughs>